Welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Neil Smith. I'm the president of Fairview Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to this wonderful presentation we're going to have today. Um, for the past two or three years, we've been getting out in the community and talking about several uh, projects and things we'd like to talk about in our community, particularly our health needs assessment. That's very important to us as far as getting out in the community and addressing the problems that are in our community. And what we have found in Northeast Ohio is that we do have a higher than average incidence of infant and maternal mortality. And we are the, one of the largest birthing hospitals in the whole state of Ohio. As a matter of fact, we're the second largest birthing hospital in the whole state of Ohio at Fairview Hospital. And we have a tremendous uh, obstetrician and, and pediatric staff here at Fairview Hospital. And we wanna get out and address some of these issues and see what we can do to improve our both infant and maternal mortality rates. Uh, we actually had this originally planned to be at John Marshall High School in their new uh, auditorium, and we were going to have a lunch provided and things like that. But we're going to continue once this COVID situation is uh, taken care of, get back out in the community, particularly at John Marshall, and offer further events. So stay tuned for that. But I really want to welcome you. I think you're going to really find this program tonight very informative. We have expert panelists to discuss all aspects of both of these situations. And I'd like to turn it over to our moderator today, the Chairman of Obstetrics at Fairview Hospital, Dr. Amy Stevens. Amy, take it away. Thank you, Neil, and thank you for your support of this program. Without your support, we wouldn't have been able to move forward. Um, good, af good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Amy Stevens. Um, I, am welcome I am happy to welcome you today and serve as your moderator. Um, just a few words about Fairview Hospital. As Dr. Smith has told you, um, we are the second busiest maternity hospital in the state of Ohio. We also recently received recognition by Newsweek, and we were voted one of the best maternity hospitals in the United States. Now, this afternoon, we're going to talk about preparing for healthy childbirth and beyond. Um, so please take a deep breath. Try to relax, get comfortable. We have a wonderful panel um, assembled of obstetric specialists, both maternal fetal medicine and our generalists, um, mid, um, midwifery specialists, uh, leaders in public health and pediatrics. So I know it will be a wonderful afternoon. Um, we must always remember COVID-19 is out there, but we're gonna take this opportunity to prepare um, for a healthy start. Uh, for mom and baby. Um, prevention is key with COVID-19. Please remember to wear a mask everywhere. Wash your hands well. Uh, prevention is key for you and your family. So please also get adequate rest and nutrition. So we're going to start now with our first panelist, who is uh, Sue Hudson. Sue Hudson has been working as a nurse midwife for almost 25 years in Northeast Ohio. She graduated with a degree in biology from Kenyon College and went on for a master's work at Bowling Green State University. After starting her own family, she realized that she wanted to practice midwifery more than bench science. Her inspiration came in part from Cindy Cover, one of the Cleveland Clinic Hillcrest midwifery team members. Sue graduated from Case Western Reserve University, attaining her master's in nurse midwifery. She has served as chair of the American College of Nurse Midwifery in the Northeast Ohio chapter twice, and was president of the Ohio Association of Advanced Practice Nurses. Six months ago, Sue was named to direct the Cleveland Clinic Midwifery Service, where she also directs the Centering Pregnancy Program. She is also one of our, our main advocates at Fairview um, Hospital, for our family birthplace, uh, which specializes in non-medicated births for families. So Sue, it's all you. Thanks very much, Dr. Stevens. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. And um, as Dr. Stevens pointed out, my, my charge was to uh, tell you a little bit about the childbirth education that's available for you and, and what you can expect from it. Um, you know, knowledge is power. And the more knowledge you have, uh, the more capable you are of uh, caring for your little one, caring for yourself, caring for your family. Um, 
power can be attained in so many ways. Um, certainly, um, books are one way. Go ahead and uh, flip a slide for me, Jeff, please. Um, books are one way. Oh, that's okay. That got changed. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, we'll we'll do this. We'll before we go to that one. I want to tell you, books are one way you can attain knowledge. I have three of my favorites with me tonight. One is A Working Woman's Pregnancy Book by Marjorie Greenfield. One is Ina May's Guide to Birth to Childbirth by Ina May Gaskins. And one is Birthing from Within by Pam England. Um, two of those are very pragmatic. One is very crunchy. The crunchy one, Ina May's, might set you off a little bit, but there's great information in there and books can give you so much. All of those are available from your local library. Um, and I would encourage you to start your journeys into motherhood by picking up some good books that uh, provide really great information. Um, you know, another source for information and things that we do all the time when we get pregnant is we turn to our family and friends. Um, and, and they're great sources of information if they've been down that road. But you always want to have that balanced out with a provider who can make sure that the information you're getting is, is proper and safe. Um, one piece of, uh, or one source for information that I want to share with you, I, I, a lot of times we tend to, to uh, 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 look over the value that our instincts have, but I'm going to tell you something, trust your gut. If you have worries, know that you can come to your Cleveland Clinic provider, be it midwife or physician, and uh, you will be heard. And uh, we will take care of you because we are all very cognizant of the fact that the child that you're carrying may be the one that saves the planet. Okay. So you've heard Dr. Steven Zandi mention midwives. First off, well, what the heck's a midwife? Um, midwives are sort of the, the specialists in totally normal. Um, we work very closely with an amazing team of uh, obstetrician gynecologists at Fairview. And we work with our uh, teammates both in the hospital and also in the offices. Um, we, we are there to totally work with you to protect the normalcy of your pregnancy and your birth. If you need the support of a physician by Cracky, we're going to get you to a physician because guess what? If you're my daughter, that's who I want you to see. I love my kids, but they're no better than you are. So the team, uh, the team system that we have running right now, I think is one of the best. I know it's the best I've ever worked with and I'm confident it's one of the best in the country. Um, the collaborative care that we have there is uh, at Fairview Hospital is next to none. Um, so with that said, you're going to hear me refer to providers, okay, as opposed to doctor or midwife. When you hear me say, talk to your provider, talk to your provider, whoever that is. Um, so one of the things that I want to share with you is the slide you're looking at right now is about centering pregnancy. And, you know, first we ask, well, what is it? Um, centering pregnancy is another way that you can get information about uh, your birth and your pregnancy while you're in your obstetrical visit. On average, doctors and midwives will spend, uh, providers will spend about anywhere from five to 15 minutes with you at any given visit. Let's take the average of that. On average, if you are spending 10 minutes with a provider and you do that for 12 visits over the course of your pregnancy, you're gonna spend a total of about two hours with your provider in which we'll try to teach you as much as we can in that time. Um, centering pregnancy is group-based care that um, includes groups of eight to 10 moms about do it about the same time as you are. Um, and in that group visit, which lasts two hours, 10 times for a total of 20 hours, we do your prenatal visit and then we spend about an hour of each visit learning about whatever is appropriate for uh, your gestational age. Um, and 
uh, the groups are conducted. I'm going to have you flip the slide, please. Groups are conducted in a circle, um, socially distanced. Okay, and we are just now starting to rev up some small groups, socially distanced, and we actually have the capability of doing it like we're doing right now as a hybrid form. Some moms virtual, some moms in person, and it's been delightful because centering provides the community that it takes to help keep a pregnancy safe and healthy. Um, moms come into their centering group and for their first visit, they're gonna learn about how to take care of, how to, how to measure their blood pressure, what, why is their weight important? You're gonna, you're gonna be involved in some self-care. You evaluate how you're doing in the course of your pregnancy. Um, each visit has explicit topics that we go over, again, that are appropriate for your given gestational age. And um, we get information not only from the centering book that every mom will receive, but also from each other. And your provider will be there to help facilitate that conversation. The next slide will actually give you a little indication about what information is included. 10 sessions, like I told you, the first couple of sessions are involved in things that are important throughout the course of your pregnancy, but a little more important at the beginning. Things like, how do we keep you nutritionally healthy? What about lifestyle choices? You know, women in centering groups are way more likely to quit smoking than women in one-to-one -one visits. That's really important. We also like to start early with reassuring or uh, uh, reassuring you that dental care is not only good, but it's important and you should go. Did you know every woman should see a dentist at least twice during the course of a pregnancy? Those are the kinds of things that we talk about in group. It's really important to take care of you. Body changes, managing stress, what about your family, breastfeeding, all of these topics carry through your entire pregnancy. But having a one visit where we can talk about each of these things helps us help you. Um, we discuss postpartum depression. We talk about parenting. Centering is a model that uh, really gives you that sense of uh, uh, support. It adds enormously to your uh, uh, knowledge base and it really makes you feel close to your provider, um, which, you know, trust is important. And that's a place where we get, get the time to really, really build that. Um, let's see. We talk about a lot of stuff. You can see that based on, on just that slide, which is so incredibly busy, and I apologize for that. I do want to let you know that the pictures that you're seeing right now are actually from some of the centering groups that have happened with the Cleveland Clinic. Um, Jeff, can we go to the next slide, please? I want to let you know where you can get centering care. Um, centering is available at South Point in Warrensville Heights at Westlake, out at our Columbia Road office, over at the Stephanie Ch Tubbs Jones Health Center in Cleveland or in Euclid, I apologize, at our Lakewood office. And we're working on trying to get a program together at our Westtown office right now too. We've done one pilot centering group, which landed right at the outset of the COVID coronavirus crisis, but you know what? We pulled it off and the moms were really happy. Um, lastly, I want to give, you, give everybody uh, um, some information on just the routine childbirth education that's available through the Cleveland Clinic virtually through our distance learning. Um, we have classes in breastfeeding. We have classes that are available um, on parenting. Uh, we have um, availability to teach all of our new parents about infant first aid and CPR. And hey, how about this one, boot camp for dads? That's a good one. Um, the Cleveland Clinic, we want, we want you to be successful. In fact, the babies that you're carrying right now are nothing but quivering masses of potential. By education, you can help develop that potential to be the best that it can be. And that's what we're looking for for you also. So if anybody has any questions, I'm around and I'd love to see you. Um, and with that, Dr. Stevens, I'm passing the baton. Well, thank you so much, Sue. 
If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box. While we're waiting, I'm going to ask um, Sue a few questions of my own. All right. Um, do you see all of the providers if you are doing centering? That's a great question, Dr. Stevens. So a lot of times uh, there, are, there are occasions when one provider may be um, uh, uh, may fill in for another. But I'll tell you honestly, my centering groups are my centering groups. I'm very possessive of them. Um, we do, um, on the midwife side of things, Dr. Stevens, we are uh, uh, resurrecting our Meet the Midwife Night. So anybody who's seeing a midwife-led centering uh, group will certainly have an opportunity to meet all of the team, uh, including all of, all of the midwives that may be with them when they birth. Now, if you really enjoy centering, is there a way to continue with the pediatrician after your baby's delivered? That is yet an another, that's another great question. So the Cleveland Clinic is in the process right now of developing their centering parenting program. What we'd like to see ideally would be to take our centering families that are going through centering pregnancy and then move on to centering uh, parenting with their little ones so that they can see all their babies together for all their well child checks. Um, and I, I don't know if uh, Dr. Estray is gonna be speaking to that later on or not, but. And one last question, are there any other educational programs available to patients and their partners that you'd like to mention? Um, we have virtual hospital tours, there is a, um, a childbirth education Bradley method, which is a very fourth floor unit that you mentioned earlier, Dr. Stevens. And you can get a virtual tour of that fourth floor unit, which is where moms who just want to come in and have a baby who are healthy and who are laboring. I don't see any questions, so we're going to move on to Dr. Berkowitz. Next, we have... Dr. Kathleen Berkowitz, who joined the Cleveland Clinic two years ago after spending most of her career in California. So we're so happy to have her. Um, in California, she worked extensively with the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, implementing quality protocols. She has also run a maternal transport program and served as regional director for the California Diabetes and Pregnancy Program. The experience with those programs provided insight into the barriers that exist for patients to consistently receive evidence-based and effective care. She will be speaking today about the very common problem of preterm delivery and how to empower patients to ensure they have equal access to the best treatment. Her most important job, of course, is Vice Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Cleveland Clinic Fairview Hospital. And Dr. Berkowitz, please. Uh, thank you very much for letting me speak with you tonight. I, um, one of the things I really love about Cleveland Clinic and Fairview Hospital in, in particular is the team concept of care that we share. Um, I am a maternal fetal medicine specialist, as Sue told you. She's a midwife and she takes care of normal. And you get to meet me when things are not so normal. Um, in between, we have all sorts of caregivers that are nurses uh, who you will see at your bedside all the time. We have also got pharmacists and blood bank personnel that you won't see. Uh, we even have EPIC implementation folks who make platforms like this available when we get whacked with things like COVID. So I, I'm here on really on behalf of the team. And what I want to do is talk about how to prevent you from having a preterm birth. This is a really common problem. In 2018, uh, about one out of every 10 infants was born in the United States was born preterm. I know there are people on this call who have had this affect their own lives or that of their friends. Uh, I myself have had a 32 weeker. So I know what it's like to watch your baby on a ventilator. I know what it's like to try and get a 32 weeker to try and breastfeed. I know what it's like to have to take your baby for two years for special follow-up to make sure that all the milestones are being needed. And that's not even mentioning 
what your share of cost is at and what mine was in 1996. Um, we for a while, thought we were doing pretty well with this. From about 2012 to about 2014, the rates started to go back about down, and that was a good thing. However, we've gone back up, and so now we're in a situation where we were not doing as well in 2018 as we were in 2014. There's many reasons for it. We don't understand them all, but what we have noticed is a couple of very key facts. In 2018, the rate of preterm birth was much higher among African American women than it was in white women for that rate of preterm birth. We also know that in that first year of life, the, the, uh, the very, very important first year of life, one of the biggest mortality issues for a baby in that first year of life is having been born preterm. We would like that to not happen. What I'd like to do with the talk we have today is to talk about how you and your caregivers working together can prevent this from happening to you. I think we have three time periods in which we can work together to try and decrease the risk of this happening to you. Um, and they all have different strategies. One is planning pregnancy together in which you're going to get a healthy start even before you conceive. The next would be working in partnership with your team throughout the pregnancy to learn the things that are going to help keep you healthy and have a good term outcome with your baby going home with you. And then finally, if this does happen to you, if you are in preterm labor, how do you access, how do you make sure that you get the optimum care for you and your baby if you're gonna face a preterm labor or even a preterm birth? About 60% of pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. That doesn't mean they're not wanted. It simply means that people didn't plan for them to happen. And that's a problem if you have some underlying health issues like so many of us do, diabetes and hypertension and thyroid disease and kidney disease and asthma, and gosh, I've been trying to quit smoking. Um, I've been trying to lose weight. I've got some dependency issues that I wanted to get under control before this happened. And so there are many, many opportunities, but they all start with your interaction at a routine care visit with your caregiver. And these are the things I'd like you to ask. Once you've gotten through your blood pressure and your weight and all the issues that are important, ask, hey, I wanna get pregnant. I want to get pregnant in the next three, six, nine months. Um, what can I do to improve my health prior to getting pregnant? So, for example, diabetes. Um, is your hemoglobin A1C where it needs to be for a healthy start? If it's not, if it's high, you may be at an increased risk for a miscarriage. Those problems happen early. If you have high blood pressure, are your medicines the right ones to be on throughout the whole pregnancy? Um, if you're exposed to smoke or secondhand smoke, what can you do to minimize your risk of those problems? If you're overweight at the start of the pregnancy, well, how can you improve your nutrition before you achieve pregnancy? Uh, one thing that many people are not aware of is that even small amounts of weight loss, 10, 20 pounds for someone whose body mass index is high, actually improves your outcomes in pregnancy and improves your ability to conceive. Next question is really ask specific questions for your caregivers on how you can be helped to achieve those things. Um, your caregivers, look for them to be open to answer your questions, to explain what goals you need to reach and why, and get really, really detailed on what you want to get. So for instance, not just, I want to improve my blood sugar, how about, I want to get my hemoglobin A1C down from 7.5 to 6.5% over the next three months. How can I do that? How are you going to help me do that? Um, and it's going to have to involve your team in and out of that visit. You're going to need continuing guidance, and you're going to have continuing questions about how to get there. Your caregivers should be able to give you those things. One of the very important things for those people who have had a preterm birth in the past 
is there is a medication called 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone caproate. You'll hear it called 17P. Um, it comes in a shot form for some women and it comes in a suppository form for other problems. But if you have a history of a spontaneous preterm birth, something that happened more than three weeks before your due date, you are a candidate for using these medications. And if somebody comes to me and says, you know what, I've got a medication that could decrease your risk of having another preterm birth by 30 to 50%, I'd say, tell me more. How do I get this medication? And so this is information that you should be looking for if you've had a history of a preterm birth in the past where you went into labor on your own. Okay, working in partnership with your entire team throughout the pregnancy. Um, questions you want to know. Is my caregiver easy to reach? In addition to my plan visits, can I do virtual visits? Are there my chart tools where I can reach and chat with them? Um, are there group visits like Sue talked about? Um, if you are a uh, person who doesn't have English skills, what translator services are gonna be available? Are there people in my community and my ethnic group who are gonna work with me and go with me to my appointments? Uh, so ask your caregiver these things. Um, your caregiver, whether it's Sue or myself or Dr. Stevens, anyone uh, in, this, in, our, in our group, is my caregiver giving me optimal care? Have they explained to me when I need ultrasounds and why? Have they explained to me what to expect and what questions to ask when I have my ultrasound? Have they explained to me how much weight I should be gaining and at what rate during what part of the pregnancy? Have they talked to me about what my blood pressure goals should be, what my glucose goals should be, what my exercise goals should be? Um, signs and symptoms of preterm labor are very important. For people who have had a pregnancy before, well, contractions may be easy to recognize. If this is your first pregnancy, contractions may be very difficult to tell apart from back pain or general pregnancy discomforts. And so those things are questions that should be answered for you in your visits. Um, changes in vaginal discharge can be, again, very subtle. Lots of people understand bleeding is a bad thing, um, but changes in vaginal discharge can be more subtle and may be missed, especially if it's your first pregnancy. Leaking fluid, is it your bladder? Or did you actually break your water? Those are things that you need to be able to differentiate and your caregiving team can help you figure out what to do in each one of those sessions. And then finally, if you really do experience preterm labor and you have to go to the hospital, have a plan that you have talked with your care team about beforehand. Which hospital is closest to me? How do I get there? Do I call 911? Do I have a neighbor bring me? Uh, do I have to take a bus? How am I gonna get there? Um, who's gonna watch my kids while I have to go to the hospital? Um, who do I ask to see when I get there? Or do I have to sit in an emergency room? So at each stage of your pregnancy, those answers will change and your caregiving team should be working with you to get you that information. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then the scary stuff happens and you actually have a, an event of preterm labor and you're worried that you're going to have a preterm delivery. Here's some key questions I think everyone needs to ask about where they're at, who's taking care of them, and what things will be done. Is the hospital I'm at able to provide care for my preterm baby? Uh, are patients living in Elyria and further out in the suburbs may not have a hospital that can take care of the specialized needs for a 24 to a 28 week baby. You may need to get to your local hospital and then ask that question. And if the answer is, wow, we don't have the things we think you're gonna need, talk about getting transported to a hospital that can provide those things. How are you gonna get there? Ambulance, where are you going? How is your support person going to get there? They generally are not allowed to ride in the ambulance with you. So they may need to follow or they may need some other sort of transportation. And so those are issues to ask when you get there. What treatments are going to be used to protect me and my baby? Do I need antibiotics? 
Do I need IV fluids? Uh, if I'm bleeding, will I accept a transfusion? Will you be able to give it to me? Do I want it? Those are questions to ask as well. What treatments are gonna be used to protect my baby? Common things that we use are magnesium sulfate, which helps protect the baby's brain, steroids, which help develop the lung function if a baby is born premature, and antibiotics, which may help prevent uh, infection during labor or in the early prenatal or postnatal care in the nursery. Um, can I have a de vaginal delivery even though I'm preterm or do I need a cesarean section? Uh, can I talk to the specialists in the neonatal intensive care unit about what to expect? You should be able to talk to them at a hospital that is going to be caring for a baby that is born preterm. And talking to them can give you a very good sense of the next team who's going to be taking care of your baby and that you will be interacting with. What medications are going to be used to slow down the, the preterm labor should it occur? All of these are questions that you're going to need answers to, and I'd love you to just have the information and be feel empowered to answer those questions. Why? Well, next slide. I had the experience of having to watch my babies taken care of by somebody else, and they had to live in a little plastic box for a while. Um, I'd like you not to have to have that experience. I want you to have what the lady in the lower right-hand corner has, which is the experience of taking her baby home with her and being able to take care of her baby herself. And I hope this has helped and uh, given you some knowledge as to how to keep you and your baby safe during pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berkowitz. Um, I do have one question in the chat box. What is the miscarriage rate now? It seems much higher than before. You know, when miscarriages happen to you, you become aware of how common it is. In general, 20 to even 25% of pregnancies never make it out of the first trimester. In most cases, that's because the chromosomes just did not line up right. I take care of half a dozen women a day who've had a miscarriage and we're not aware of how common that was until it happened to them. And it's very difficult to think back on if I'd only done this or if I hadn't done that. Be empowered to ask those questions if you are having a miscarriage. In the majority of cases, having one miscarriage in the first trimester doesn't mean that it's gonna happen again in the next pregnancy. Preterm labor, on the other hand, if you've had a preterm baby, you have a risk of having another one. It could even be earlier than the one that you had the first experience with. And we'd like to prevent that from happening to you. Thank you, Dr. Berkowitz. Can you um, say a little bit more about the 17P shot that you mentioned? And um, does it have any effect on the baby? Okay, so very important, 17P, is a medication that for someone who's pregnant with one baby this time and who had a spontaneous early delivery last time, went into labor and delivered before, more than three weeks before the due date, that person should be offered shots starting at 16 to 18 weeks of pregnancy. And they are shots and they are once a week. They come in two forms. They come in a form that you can inject into the muscle and you usually need a nurse to help you with that injection. And now more recently, they've come as an auto injector that'll come, that you'll, comes to your house and you can inject yourself and it'll be a three to a five week supply that you'll have at home. They come in both forms and those shots should continue up until about 36 to 37 weeks. The Ohio, the Ohio Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative has put a big initiative in to make sure that your insurance companies cover the costs of this. You may have some out-of-pocket costs. My experience has been that the manufacturers for the medication do try and make it easy to pay for, and the insurers generally cover it. So while it may not be completely free, I will tell you it's way less. The entire course of the therapy is way less than what you would experience having to pay for even a day in the neonatal 
ICU, much less the emotional issues that you're going to have of just watching your baby in that situation. So if you think it's too expensive, if you've originally gotten a no from your insurance company, push a little bit. Um, at Cleveland Clinic, we have a progesterone care coordinator. And whenever I see a patient who in an ultrasound who's at risk, I will message my uh, care coordinator. I'll find out from my patient whether she'd prefer to be contacted by phone or by my chart and we'll get the medication into her hands so that she can use it if she wants it. Now, as to how it affects the baby, it doesn't. Um, babies that are born at, say, 28 weeks, whether they've been exposed to 17P from their mom taking the shots or not, they do the same down the line when they're two, three, four years old. So they're not better, they're not worse, but in general, instead of getting born at 28 weeks, well, maybe they're born at 32 weeks or 34 weeks, or maybe you've even gone to term. So that's my take on, on why you should consider taking the medication. And it should be something that is made affordable for you. Wonderful. And what happens if you do take those shots, if you miss a shot and you can't get it every single week? Well, you should get back on the shots. There's a little bit of data out there that says if you miss two or three shots, your risk for another preterm delivery starts to go back up. So missing one shot is sort of like missing one birth control pill. You need to get right back on. Um, but you can get right back in, even if you've missed it, you're three or four days late because the mail didn't arrive. Uh, go ahead and take your shot and then continue every week. If you've missed two or three weeks, you're still going to be okay to get it. If you weren't able to start at 16 to 18 weeks, you're starting at 20 or 21, it may not work quite as well for you, but it's still worth starting. The one thing we can say about the shots is once you have started with the symptoms of preterm labor, with your cervix opening up or shortening, then it doesn't seem to work as well. Thank you so much. Next, we'll have Dr. Edward Chen. He will be speaking on the postpartum transition. Dr. Chen joined the Cleveland Clinic in December. He is an obstetrician gynecologist as well as a subspecialist trained in maternal fetal medicine. Dr. Chen has held many roles in the past, including as the site PI for the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institutes of Health Child Health and Human Development Maternal Fetal Medicine Units Network and the National Fetal Growth Studies. His clinical interests include medical complications of pregnancy and preterm birth. Hello, and thank you for all, for all of you for joining us. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Stevens, for holding this program. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about postpartum care. When we talk about pregnancies, we tend to focus on um, the time from conception through delivery. In fact, obstetrician or obstetric care is often referred to as prenatal care, suggesting that the postpartum period is unimportant. In fact, in the past few years, a great amount of attention has been drawn to the postpartum period because of the associated morbidities and mor mortalities that, is, that are associated in this period of time. Next slide. I think it is human nature for us to focus on child rearing after delivery, but the postpartum period is not all about the baby. Although it is an important part and involves new responsibilities and, challenging, uh, and challenges in the postpartum period, it is also time for a, a great amount of transition. While physiologic changes occur over nine months to prepare your body for birth, the return back to pre-pregnancy uh, physiologic state actually occurs over a much shorter period of time, about four to six weeks. Just imagine what that actually means. Um, going, taking nine months to get to a point and then reversing direction uh, in a six week period. In addition, the mother must um, alter her sleep patterns and the role of caring for another individual, creating emotional stresses um, requiring behavioral changes. 
The recognition of these changes are often discussed in some of these books. In the past few years, um, our uh, national societies have also raised awareness and dem as demonstrated by an article published a few years ago. This article by Kristen Tully and uh, Allison Stuby brought attention to the medical community that we need to have greater focus on the postpartum period. Now often, to re often referred to as a fourth trimester, these authors reviewed some of the transitions that occur during the postpartum period uh, or referred to as a fourth trimester. Haywood Brown, the former president of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2017, made the postpartum care a focus of his term as president. He proposed adding a visit um, during the first three weeks during the, of the postpartum period to address issues such as uh, depression and contraception. He brought a great amount of awareness and intention and recognition that the postpartum period is associated with uh, potentially health, potential health concerns for the new mother. In this article by Groot, who evaluates the population prevalence of a variety of adverse outcomes immediately postpartum, these graphs summarize their results. Overall, 55% of mother-baby pairs experience at least one um, health issue uh, during the immediate postpartum period. Breast issues were the most common maternal complication. Half of the 55% had more than one, one reported issue uh, that required medical attention. Although many of these may be considered minor by healthcare uh, workers, these complications were considered worthy of, 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 of evaluation by the community health provider um, uh, seeing, the, seeing these patients. Um, you can see by the darkest column um, that issues peaked around six days postpartum and approximately one in 20 women having an issue that required attention. Overall, major maternal issues occurred in 5% of postpartum women. Next slide. This uh, diagram from Tully's article depicts the comp complex associations of various domains that interact in the fourth trimester, mood and emo emotional well-being, infant care and feeding, sexuality, contraception, and birth spacing that directly relate to risk of preterm birth, sleep and fatigue, physical recovery from childbirth, medications that often are prescribed during the postpartum period, and substances and exposures. Next slide. In 2018, the American College of of obstetrics and gynecology proposed the following target, targeted assessments during the fourth trimester. Many of these assessments coincide with physiologic adjustments that are recognized in postpartum complications that occur. We know that blood pressure rises during the first, um, during the first week after delivery with hypertinatally can have as high as a one in 10 chance of readmission during the first week. In addition, we know that signs of dep depression can start to appear in mothers who are progressively more sleep deprived. We also recognize women will start to ovulate as soon as 14 days uh, after delivery. We know recognize that short into pregnancy intervals uh, will, will increase the risk for preterm birth. This figure suggests three different contact points uh, during the postpartum period that may help to uh, improve outcomes, um, which is a significant paradigm shift compared to the single uh, visit that has been prescribed for decades. At the Cleveland Clinic, all women are, are offered a two-week postpartum visit that can occur virtually or in person. In addition, in patients with hypertensive complications of pregnancy are offered or given a nurse visit, um, usually during the first one to two weeks after discharge for a follow-up evaluation of their, of their blood pressure, hoping to catch patients who have um, what is often referred to as postpartum preeclampsia. Other things that the postpartum encounter can address 
uh, include transition adjustments, uh, evaluation of sleep, breastfeeding sexuality, um, uh, and birth spacing with the um, initiation of contraception if it was not initiated um, prior to discharge. Last but not least, um, we can consider the evaluation as, uh, we can often consider postpartum or pregnancy as a stress test that brings out um, chronic or brings out medical conditions that pretend to uh, future health consequences. The fourth trimester is a good time to begin discussions concerning chronic health issues and health maintenance. Next slide. Finally, I want to bring to your attention uh, the Cleveland Clinic website that offers uh, information about classes and education uh, that Sue Hudson referred to before, breastfeeding, care of your newborn, and um, birth uh, information. Um, thank you, Amy. If there are any questions. A few questions. Um, what are some specific things or signs a patient should be looking for after they go home? So in general, similar to having a surgery or a procedure, you should generally start to feel uh, um, better over time. So the pain that you, you might be having on your perineum from a vaginal delivery should slowly get better. Um, bleeding should also continue to decrease. And if you start feeling poorly, you should actually give your doctor or provider uh, a call. Wonderful. And one last question. Um, when, when should I call or see my doctor after delivery? Well, we would encourage you to see your doctor at that two-week postpartum visit, either virtually or in person, so that we can check on you and make sure that there are no issues, uh, no concerns for depression, make sure that you're feeling well on your blood pressure um, or, or addressing any issues somewhere between four to six weeks after delivery uh, to make sure your transition uh, has occurred normally. Wonderful, thank you so much. So next, our next speaker will be Dr. Stacy Javeri. Dr. Javeri will be speaking on maternal health and mortality. Dr. Javeri is an OB physician who has practiced at Cleveland Clinic Fairview Hospital for 22 years and is medical director of the Women's Health Westlake Clinic. She is also assistant program director for the OBGYN residency program and assistant clerkship director for Lerner College of Medicine, the OBG OB clerkship. Dr. Javeri? Thanks, Dr. Javeri. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for um, hanging in there. This has been a great program so far. So um, I was given the topic of maternal health and mortality. So if you're anything like me, my initial thought was that seems rather doom and gloom. I'm not sure I really wanted to talk on that. Um, but then I really started to realize it's really not doom and gloom. It, it's encouraging, it's empowering, because you know, really discussing this problem allows us to identify what we can do together to minimize risks and get a successful, healthy outcome. Uh, Sue Hudson mentioned earlier, it's a team effort. And I think talking about some of the negative things that can happen help to empower us to work together as a team so that we don't get negative outcomes. So um, to get started, um, can I have the next slide, please? Great, so this is the trend of maternal deaths um, in the United States, and it's not hard to see over time, that number has continued to increase. This is a 30 year graph, but it is possible that the numbers may not actually be increasing. There could be some, uh, uh, what's the word, reporting, uh, differences, we start to report things a little better, so the numbers look higher. But the fact remains that still in the US today, our pregnant women and postpartum moms are dying. Um, fortunately, there are a lot of factors with uh, increased risk in maternal death that can be modified and treated um, to help prevent these kind of tragedies, and that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, so this is a list of the factors that have been associated with poor maternal outcomes. Um, unfortunately, there are considerable differences um, with race and ethnic, uh, I guess, considerable racial and ethnic disparities. Um, it's true, black women are at higher risk than American Indian women, greater than Asian women, greater than white women, and all greater than Hispanic women. Um, 
it is pretty clear that we need to do a lot more to understand this discrepancy. And fortunately here in Cleveland, we have some groups uh, working collaboratively to help address this issue, but um, certainly not something that is being ignored. Um, but as you know, we have um, no control over our race or our age for that matter. So um, what I really wanna emphasize is that you do have control over absolutely everything else. Um, as Dr. Berkowitz and Sue uh, Hudson discussed earlier, access to optimum prenatal care really in any form can significantly decrease preterm birth. Um, it's also been shown that women who receive prenatal care have a fourfold decreased risk in maternal mortality. Um, socioeconomic status, um, you know, how much you make, what area you live, um, the socioeconomic status of communities can definitely have an impact on the quality health care options that you have. But fortunately, um, as Dr. Smith and his team have showcased here today, Fairview Hospital and Westtown Physician Center, where I work, as well as many of the Cleveland Clinic regional offices, um, where you are, you are basically in the backyard of absolutely state-of-the-art prenatal care. So you're very fortunate. It takes one simple visit to, you know, to start your journey into a healthy pregnancy outcome. So please, if you don't remember anything else from this, don't forget, get yourself established with prenatal care. Um, it'll help in so many ways. Um, there are also increasing numbers of women in the U.S. that have chronic health conditions. Um, I didn't really list them all there, but hypertension or high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic heart disease, and these conditions absolutely can put a pregnant woman at higher risk. But unfortunately, discussing all of the potential medical problems you could have is outside the scope of this talk. But be reassured, you know, once you have established prenatal care, um, I'm going to sound like a broken record, you need prenatal care. Um, you know, your provider or caregiver can work with you to optimize your condition and minimize any risk that that poses in your pregnancy. So please, if you know that you have any conditions like this or you haven't been evaluated yet, please see your physician or caregiver to screen for them and manage them. It really, you know, often only takes a few simple adjustments in medication or lifestyle or something to really improve your health and decrease your risks. But again, just getting established with prenatal care is a huge step in the right direction. Um, what I wanted to review is some of the more common health conditions that are modifiable, things that you do have control over. Um, I'll take the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, you know, just because you're pregnant, um, actually, the hormones of pregnancy place women at increased risk for some scary kind of cardiovascular events. But I think it's really important to know that as a smoker, you have a fourfold increased risk of having a heart attack compared to a non-smoking pregnant woman. Um, and a two-fold increased risk of a pulmonary embolus. If you don't know what that is, that's a blood clot that goes to your lung and can actually cause instant death. So we don't want any increased risk for this. Um, please don't smoke is the number one um, goal, but um, I get it. You know, my mom was a smoker. Um, many of you smoke. Uh, you might have parents who smoked and everyone did just fine. I know, I get it. But don't be naive, it's 2020, you're educated, you're resourceful, it does not take much to understand and know that smoking is bad for you. It is quite evident that smoking women have increased miscarriages, they have smaller birth weight babies, they've increased bleeding complications and emergency deliveries, um, they even have a 50% increased risk of stillbirth. Um, and the risks don't end with the delivery. Um, this graph here shows the risk of sudden infant death syndrome or sudden unexplained infant death as you can see, if you go from the left to right, um, for every extra cigarette you have per day, there's an increased risk to the baby. Um, but we, what you can also take away from that is the good news, any decrease in smoking has been shown to have decreased risk to the baby. So um, we don't like smoking. I'm sure you, a lot of people are smoking, don't want to be smoking, but um, just knowing that if you decrease a little bit, that's going to help a lot. But there are many, many reasons sources to help you stop smoking. Um, and not to be a broken record, but um, when you attend your prenatal care appointment, your caregiver will help you find the best path to take um, on the road to complete smoking cessation. Um, I hear it over and over again from my pa pregnant patients that it's actually easier than you think to stop when you're pregnant. So I don't know if that's a motivation because you're pregnant and trying to be a good mom, or if it has to do with um, trouble with nausea and smell aversions, but um, Please don't just think you can't do it. Please, please, please get help with smoking cessation. Every little bit helps um, and the more the better. So good luck with that. Uh, next slide, please. So opioids, and that's a typo, I apologize. Uh, opioids, narcotics, drugs, basically. Um, 
I wish this was something that we didn't need to discuss, but um, the number of pregnant women with opioid use disorder actually more than quadrupled in the last 10 years. So not surprisingly, um, there are several serious health, health outcomes that have been linked to opioid abuse in pregnancy, which include you know, preterm birth, stillbirth, um, and even maternal death. So there are also quite um, serious risks to the newborn. Uh, that's why I have this graph. If you think about it, if I'm a fetus and I'm in the uterus, and I'm getting drugs from my mom's blood supply, and then I deliver, and suddenly I'm not getting drugs anymore. What's gonna happen? I'm gonna have withdrawal symptoms just like anybody else. But it's quite scary in a newborn. It can cause seizures and actually is very life-threatening for a baby. And that's what I've listed here as neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's when a baby all of a sudden doesn't get their drugs anymore and they have very serious withdrawal. The good news though, trying to stay positive, is that effective interventions for opioids do exist. Um, and health outcomes can occur, healthy health outcomes can occur for both mothers and infants. Interestingly, to prevent withdrawal from the baby, um, we don't recommend just stopping your substance use. It's not like, I'm not gonna stop, I'm not gonna tell anyone, um, I can't stop, I'll have too many symptoms. We really don't recommend that. Um, you may have heard of, we call it medication assisted treatment um, with things like methadone or Subutex or naloxone. But these treatment options are only available when the healthcare professional is aware of the problem and the specific exposure. So please, if you or someone you know is suffering from drug abuse, opiate use disorder, please, please do not be afraid to be honest and get the healthcare team involved to help you understand the risks and make the safest choice for how to manage that during your pregnancy. Um, next slide, please. So obesity. Um, this is also disappointing because they say that somewhere around 45 to 50 percent of women entering pregnancy have a BMI greater than 30. Um, as you can see listed here, it's kind of small, but um, obesity is associated with basically increased risk of every pregnancy complication. Um, I've got a list here, but the important part is healthy nutrition cannot be emphasized enough. Um, I would absolutely love to have another hour dedicated only to discussing healthy nutrition in pregnancy. It is without a doubt the most important thing you can do. Um, but fortunately, it's very easy to search online for healthy diet and exercise regimens, and I encourage you to do so. Everybody's on their phone. Look up what to eat, what should you eat, what shouldn't you eat. Um, but right up there with the value of initiating prenatal care is eating a healthy diet. It is absolutely the most important thing you can do for yourself in pregnancy and uh, quite honestly, in life, right? Um, the other good news that I've listed kind of small there, but the good news is that any decrease in your BMI is associated with a decreased risk in the complications. So don't get discouraged. Ask your healthcare provider for support and just do your best. Um, okay, next slide. As I'm on my last slide, let's try to limit this a little bit. Um, well, I would like to say actually that just looking at the participants here, um, in my practice, I've always really tried to empower women to take control over their health. And honestly, that's why I was very honored to be asked to join the team today. But when I look at this screen and I see how many participants are here, um, although I see a few dropped off, but the ones that stuck with it, uh, the ones who made the effort to not only sign up, um, you've shown up and you've stayed on in the middle of a pandemic on a virtual program. You are not the ones I'm worried about. You are not the problem and you are absolutely part of the solution. So it genuinely is very uplifting for me to see that you're here. And I really hope that you continue to ask yourself what you can do to make things healthier for yourself. Um, so can you eat better? Can you exercise more? Can you get help with substance abuse? Um, but like I said, in the end, honestly, I'm genuinely not worried for any of you because, next slide please. Just being here today, you're already making the commitment to improving your health, and I sincerely commend each and every one of you. So keep it up. Um, that's absolutely awesome that you're here, and I wish you only the healthiest and happiest of pregnancies. Thank you, Dr. Javeri. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box for us. Dr. Javeri, what, what websites or apps would you recommend for women who are planning to get pregnant or pregnant to help maximize their health? Oh, that's great. Yeah, I would have loved to be um, more detailed about that. I think um, I can't even emphasize how much I could talk about nutrition and the value it has on all of these risks. But um, yes, absolutely. 
Um, I personally and professionally try to stay up to date and educate my patients based on the recommendations listed on the ACOG.org website. ACOG, A-C-O-G, is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And they provide us with the most well-researched and respected information on how to care for our patients. Um, and they are open for patients to search as well. So I highly recommend that. Patients can just go to the ACOG, A-C-O-G.org website um, and search really any question they have about pregnancy. Um, but if you just search nutrition during pregnancy, they'll find that. Um, also, the Cleveland Clinic has a wonderful program specialized for pregnant women, um, which is called Be Well Moms. It's tailored to women who have a BMI greater than 30, and they offer both individual and group sessions to educate women on the value of healthy diet choices and weight gain in pregnancy. Um, so those would be my top two. Um, I have a regular gynecologist. Can I discuss these issues about planning pregnancy, my medications with that doctor, or do I have to wait till I get pregnant to speak to an obstetrician? Oh, that's a good question. So a lot of people do ask me, they'll say, are you, um, do you also do deliveries? Or I didn't know you also did deliveries, but everyone at the Cleveland Clinic um, and at Fairview Hospital is board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology. So when you see your gynecologist, um, absolutely, we're primary caregivers and we'd be happy to talk to you about your blood pressure, your weight, nutrition. Um, Preconception counseling is incredibly important. And we can talk to you about all these things before you're pregnant. We would love to do that. Um, what can you do to be healthier before you even start to get pregnant? So yes, 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 please ask your gynecologist, um, your primary caregiver, um, any medical provider that you see, everybody can help you get started on a path to healthy nutrition. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Javeri. Next, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Karen Estrella. She's a general pediatrician. She's originally from Ecuador. She did her residency program at St. Barnabas Hospital in Bronx, New York. She is currently section head for pediatrics at Fairview Westtown Physician Center and staff physician at the Cleveland Clinic Family Health Center in Independence. She is also involved in many Cleveland Clinic Hispanic initiatives. And she will be talking to us about infant development. So hi, thank you for inviting me. Um, so this will be the second step. So we discussed already about prenatal care, the importance of a healthy pregnancy, but now it's what happens when your baby is born. So we can go to the next slide, please. So we're going to talk about the development. So when your baby is born, you will notice that your babies are really cuddled. They don't have much of a head control, especially when they are on their tummies you will notice that they are barely able to lift up their head at the beginning, but then eventually they will start becoming more active, opening their eyes, following lights. You will see that around like two months, they will be able to lift their heads up for like a little bit longer for around 45 degrees. They will start following you up more. They will become a little bit more social in the sense that they will start smiling. They will start trying to make some laughing. They might start trying to use their hands to put them on their mouth. And definitely they become more correlated with their, with their caregiver. Because of this, it's really important that what we discuss in our first lesson is that you want to keep safe sleep. Babies, because of this concern that they don't have a good head control, it's not appropriate and it's not something that we will recommend that you have the babies on their tummies when they are not supervised because there is higher risk of sudden infant death. Which basically as babies have reflux as most of the babies, there is always a chance that if they are on their tummies and if they have any throwing up or any spit ups, potentially they may aspirate. So there is no problem if you do tummy time while you're supervised and the baby, but otherwise, please put them always on their back to be on the safe side. Definitely try to change them up positions because as you will hear us, and especially the Western, you will notice that I always tell them like change of position so your baby's head will not get flat. And definitely even at this age, you want to keep a lot of contact with the baby and start talking, 
singing. So the babies start recognizing a little bit more the voice of the caregiver. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So now uh, for four to six months, what you will notice is that your baby is going to start trying to keep their head more. They are using their elbows more to keep control. Their head is less wobbly. They will start trying to roll over, even though they might only go to one side. And then when they will start trying to sit. Don't worry, at the beginning, it's not uncommon that babies will not be able to sit fully. But the fact that they start sitting us with their hands to the front or to the sides, that will give them more balance. And this is important for babies to start being ready for uh, production of salt. If babies, they don't have a good head control and they don't have a good strength on their front, there is more risk of choking when you start with the other things that will happen at this age is kids are becoming more aware of their habits. Uh, one of the main things and is a concern with parents is that the kids start drooling and putting everything on their mouth. And one of the main questions is like, is my kid teething? So teething actually happens after they are six months old, most of the cases. But what happens is at this age, kids are very interesting because the first thing that they discover is their hands. So they will start their hands for exploring. That means that they will put everything on their mouth, they will start drooling, they will start grabbing, they will start using both hands to get. So for this case, it's very important that as for safety, that there is nothing small around the babies and that the babies actually don't have anything on their hands like jewelry or in earrings or things like that because there is more risk of that kids will grab this area and potentially they can have aspiration of these objects. The other thing is kids will start grasping things and they will start using more for transferring one object to one other side. Um, and eventually they will start sitting without any support. Um, we can go to the next slide. So for seven to nine months, this is a kind of like a game changer. At this time, your baby is more social. He will start bubbling, he will start cooing, he will start sitting and become more mobile. This is the risk of higher risk for accidents because kids will start rolling over more. They will start trying to stand up. They will start pulling themselves up from the crib or when they are in, in, in the house. And that potentially puts them at high risk that things might fall over them or that they will have more access. With this being said, it's not uncommon that babies around seven to nine months, they start lifting up, they start trying to crawl, they start imitating sounds. They might start by around nine months. They might start just saying mama, mama, da, 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 very unspecific. But they should be starting to recognize their name and follow that sound. They should start trying to eat by themselves, even if it's just grasping the food, as in the photo of the baby with both eating directly with his hands or with a spoon. And the other thing that happens at this age, kids will start trying to be a little bit more in interactive. So with that, they will start like things that they can buy and they can play. So potentially toys that make sounds or music is something that they will like. The other thing is that because of this, that they want to put everything on their mouth, you can start doing what is called baby led winning. There is a, uh, a um, is a method that you can start using for in production of solids, and that is something that with the pediatrician we will talk a little bit more about it. And then the other thing that happens at this age is that kids before that they usually they grab things with the whole hand. At this age, what they start doing is what is called a pincer grasp, in which they will start grasping things with both their two fingers, and that is something that will help down the line with the fine motor development. And lastly, by the end of nine months, they are able to be grabbing things more and be more, a little bit better with the grasp. With this being said, one of the things that we don't recommend as a pediatrician is that parents use walkers. As you see, lifting is pulling themselves up is part of their normal development. Kids don't need a walker. Walker actually is more associated with risk for kids, not only because they will be at a higher uh, seating, so they will have more access to things, 
they can go faster, they can be on tiptoeing, they can crash against other things. And besides that, there is always the chance that they might have problems of that. So definitely we don't recommend walkers, but definitely we recommend that there is a lot of floor play, but there is um, a safe environment. And we can go to the next one. And then finally from 10 to 12 months, kids start mastering their gross motor skills. So they will start crawling more, they're standing, trying to walk. They might walk with some assistance, like on the foot of the training walker or by holding the hands of the parents. They might start trying to stand for like one or two seconds without any help. They will start imitating more the communication. So this is the time that kids will start doing more para cake, they will start doing a little bit more of peekaboo. They will start pointing, laughing. They will start waving, clapping, and they will start climbing. And at the end of the year is when we start expecting that kids keep more eye contact and that they start pointing or start becoming a little bit more. So you can go to the next one. Oh, sorry, it's my kid. I'm sorry. And then, what things can you do as a parent? So, definitely one couple of things I want to do is watch and listen to how your baby communicates, repeat the sounds and words they are using. Kids learn a lot through imitation. Try to read and sing as much as you can with the babies. Um, try to encourage your child to explore, turn everyday activities into play for learning moments, help them explore, play and follow their interests, support their de baby's developmental skills, help your child feel safe and secure, be affectionate and be patient. It takes a while for them. They are discovering as they are on this journey, it's new, the same as for a parent. And here I included some resources that are useful for parents both from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, a few questions. Um, when, when should we call our pediatrician? In the so, middle of the night? So a couple of things, depends on the age. So if it's like a younger baby, like a newborn, is more concerns of, frequent the spit ups or if they're not peeing as much, there is problems with the feeding or breathing difficulty. And the main thing is fever. Fever for babies less than two months old is any fever over 100.4 grams a, a complete evaluation on those kids. Um, as they get older and they get out of this two month phase in which they are more concerns of any sepsis or like a, like a blood infection, and they have got their vaccines, then after that is pretty much if babies have a fever over 101 for more than three, four days, if they have less than three wet diapers in 24 hours, if they are not able to continue drinking the usual, and especially right now with the fall winter coming up, is they start having problems of recurrent cough or fast breathing, even if you try some nasal suctioning or you try like a humidifier and it's not working, um, then definitely they should get in touch with us. Wonderful, thank you. No Dr. Estrella, can you just please tell us um, what you suggest new parents have at home for their babies when they go home? Oh, like sure. That? So actually we don't, you don't need too many things. The base, main things that we need at home is a receiver blanket, a swaddle, a bassinet, a car seat, diapers. So um, either if, far, if moms are thinking of breastfeeding, they could get like a pump if they're thinking about that. Um, and then pretty much that's it. You don't need too much of like a lot of clothes or a lot of toys. Actually, we don't recommend any toys on babies when they are born. We don't recommend any fluffy blankets. We don't recommend putting tons of clothes on the babies. Um, so pretty much if they have like a safe place to sleep that is flat, nothing fluffy, 
they have a like a small thin blanket they have their diapers and everything for feeding like either breast milk or formula that's more than what they wonderful yeah. <laughs> thank you so much next we're going to have Frances Mills speak she's director of the community health initiatives Cleveland Office of Minority Health and Healthy Cleveland. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be a part of the panel because this is a question for all of the participants. Why would five doctors and a midwife come together to talk to you? And it's simply because exactly what the title of the presentation is that we all desire a healthy start for you and your baby but oftentimes even as much as we try to work with patients to create that healthy start it doesn't always happen and sometimes it doesn't happen because of what we call health disparities the cleveland office of minority health is an office within the department of public health that really looks at what happens to different groups of people in terms of their health outcomes, in terms of how disease affects them, and how disease progresses in them. Can I see the first slide, please? We look at the health status of minority populations. And when I say minority populations, I mean African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans and Native Americans and the impact of certain diseases on those groups like cancer, like hypertension, heart disease, like diabetes, like community violence, and certainly like infant mortality. We like to look at what are the root causes of some of those issues that impact health poorly and health disparities are simply those differences in outcome in terms of access to health, quality of health care, uh, prevalence, how often a disease happens in a community, and how often people die of those diseases. Can I see the next slide, please? What I want to say to you is that you're at a time in your life where it's a joyful time. So we don't want to really talk about uh, a whole lot of negative health, health outcomes, but there are things that impact communities of color and the general population that you need to know about in terms of causes of death. If we're talking about the general population, heart disease by far uh, is the number one cause of death across all health groups the second cause of death would be cancer. The third cause of death are accidental uh, occurrences, chronic lower respiratory disease, and stroke. Diabetes, depending on the group, would be a sixth, fourth, fifth, or sixth cause of death. So uh, we look at those chronic health conditions that impact communities of color and infant mortality is, is one of those things that impacts uh, African-American women primarily in our community in a negative way. But I want to say to you that you've heard from a lot of physicians, race is not a risk factor. Racism is a risk factor because certain things happen to different groups that cause choices to be made uh, that might negatively impact health. Can I, what I wanna talk a little bit about is social determinants of health. Those are issues that impact health, not just what you do, because your physicians have talked to you this evening about the things that you can do the things that are in your control that can positively impact your health and your baby's health. Some of the things that certain groups of people cannot control are sometimes their level of education, their level of income, their access 
to healthcare, the foods that they have access to in their neighborhoods, how well they have social supports in their family or in their friend circle. The, these are sometimes things that impact individual decisions about health and how they respond to health and how they respond to whether or not they have the capacity to have fresh food, fruit in their neighborhood. If they have the capacity to engage with the healthcare system. There are folks in our communities that they don't have health insurance. And so as a result, they may have poor health because they're not able to follow up on certain conditions. But what is important for you is that what you need to have a healthy pregnancy and a healthy life is really understanding two things. Nobody knows how your body feels except for you. Nobody knows how you're going to respond to a situation unless you put yourself where you need to be. So what I'm saying is that in this process of pregnancy and parenting, your participation is required. Uh, each of these physicians have said in one way or another that a good clinical outcome in some way is helped along by having a relationship with your clinician. And so what that means is that you have to participate in the process. You cannot be afraid to talk to your physician. You cannot be afraid to be honest with your physician because when you do, only better things can happen as an end result. I think Dr. Berkowitz said that if there's a challenge with obesity, talking to your doctor, being planful about your pregnancy helps you in the long run. A planned pregnancy is better than an unplanned pregnancy. Or if you have a physical challenge like diabetes or hypertension, that you need to talk about those things to your physician and ask them, how can I improve this if I am planning to have a baby or if I'm already pregnant? And so being developing a relationship with your doctor is really important as you start out on this journey because sometimes as patients, we treat physicians like they know everything that there is to know and there's certain things that they will not know if we don't tell them. And so if your physician pre prescribes something to you and says, I want you to take this prenatal vitamin, or I want you to follow up on this appointment, and you know that you're unable to do that, or you don't have transportation, or you don't have the, the money to do the thing that the doctor is asking you to do, it's up to you to be honest with your caregiver and say, this is a challenge for me. Because social determinants of health, being able to afford things, pregnancy is not inexpensive. Being able to afford things is, is important. And if you don't have the income in which to take care of some of these things, there may be a program out there for you that will provide a crib for you, that will provide a car seat for you, that will provide doctors uh, diapers for you or formula for you. And so that relationship is going to be one of the most important things that you do as you embark on this pregnancy journey, because we don't always get to choose the, the type and the, the kind and the quality of education in our community. We don't always, based on our education and capacity to go to college or get an advanced degree, have the capacity to earn a high level of income. And so those are things that impact health in ways that can be improved upon. But definitely as you're going through uh, a pregnancy, if you are working in a stressful job, that stress has an impact on 
your pregnancy outcome as well. And so social determinants of health are things that impact health outcomes, can be changed over time, but definitely have the capacity to negatively impact a health outcome as well, which is why we see elevated um, instances of dis certain diseases across certain communities of color um, nationally. We see higher rates of hypertension and diabetes among African Americans and Latinos. We see not necessarily higher rates of cancer, but individuals coming into care much later than they should for a positive health outcome. And so social determinants impact health outcomes. Next slide, please. In this little pie chart, and I always like to use this pie chart because it lets you know that not everything that you do, again, impacts health. 30% of this chart, how are health outcomes determined? 30% is determined by your individual behavior, but the other 70% is impacted by perhaps the environment that you live in, uh, your social and economic condition that you live in, what kind of neighborhood you live in, what is your income, what is your educational status, uh, what happens to you when you enter into the health system. And so it's not just about your behavior, it's about all of those familial community conditions that can impact your health. Next outcome. Next slide, please. Again, health disparities in terms of reminder, differences in health and health care between different groups of people. Disparity suggests that different groups of people have a higher level of illness, injury, disability, or death experienced in comparison to other groups. Next slide. Why do we talk so much about health disparities? Some of them are the result of health inequities. Health inequities are unfair differences in health outcomes that are the result of racism, the result of policies and practices that give preferential better treatment to one group versus another group, allocates, gives resources, to groups at a higher rate in comparison to other groups. So those are health inequities, unfair differences, and inequities lead to disparities, which are dif differences in health outcomes. Next slide, please. So when we have health inequities, unfair differences in the way resources are allocated, we see higher incidences and higher rates of disease in certain groups. We see poorer health outcomes. We see differences in the types of treatment that are given to patients. We see less timely access to needed treatment. I think you heard three presenters say that it is important, prenatal care is important. Getting into prenatal care during that first trimester is important with health inequities, you also see decreased life expectancies. What that means is that if you have a burden of a disease that's greater one group than another group, you are likely to see uh, life expectancy, the length of life be shorter for the group that's experiencing a disparity. Next slide, please. When we're talking about um, infant mortality, infant mortality is the rate of death that occurs for every 1,000 live births. In our community, we see that African-American families experience infant mortality at a faster and a greater rate than white populations and Latino populations in our community. This chart shows that in 2019, of all of the infant deaths and deaths that occurred before a child turned one years of age, 
that African American families experience. 87 deaths, Hispanic families, three white families, 27. And so by far, African American families are experiencing infant mortality at a rate higher than their Latino and white counterparts. Next slide, please. And this chart simply shows the same thing that African American families experience extremely high rates of infant mortality in Cuyahoga County versus white and Hispanic families at a rate that's really unacceptable two and three times the rate. And so what that means is that African American women and families have an, an extra burden to be mindful of those things that would contribute to good health. Uh, in the African American community in the city of Cleveland, almost 40% of women are overweight. And so what would that mean in terms of a woman who would make the decision that she wants to have a child? Uh, we know that for many women, obesity would be a problem that would potentially have a negative impact on her pregnancy. Uh, hypertension is another challenge in the African-American community. And so those are things that women and families that are planning to have children uh, need to be mindful of as they enter into that process. Same thing with infant mortality. I'm not going to continue to talk about it, but over a five-year period, you see far and away uh, infant uh, deaths with African-American women, 447 in comparison to 146 white babies. And so this is a challenge that is definitely uh, significant enough to mention when we talk to women about pregnancy. It is imperative that women take care of themselves to the best of their ability. What happens when a woman um, prior to her pregnancy is important. If you're in poor health before you get pregnant, you're going to have a have, you're going to have a challenge in addressing that poor health as you move through your pregnancy. And so disparities are are things that can be addressed. And so as a pregnant woman, what I would say to you is that no, all things are not created equal, but what you can do to have a healthy pregnancy is to make sure that you're healthy as you can before you get pregnant and to be in partnership with your healthcare provider as you move through that pregnancy and to get support. If you don't have support, uh, develop a support circle through programs like Centering that will help you engage with women who are going through the same things that you are going through. And so I want to turn it back over to Amy. I'm going to stop right there and say that, remember this, race is not a risk factor, racism is, but you have to be an active participant in your own health process. Thank you so much, Ms. Mills, that was excellent. Um, I do have a few questions. What is the city of Cleveland doing to address health disparities? Well, one of the things that we are doing just in terms of the Office of Minority Health and another program that we operate called Healthy Cleveland, both of those programs work together to really uh, promote good health uh, through our Healthy Cleveland program. And then the Office of Minority Health works to educate the community about health disparities and the burden of disease that happens in community. But the city as a whole very recently passed a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. And so city policymakers are working along with healthcare providers, hospital systems, in order to develop plans to look at just those things that I talked about, social determinants of health, what causes disparity with income and education and quality of life among communities of color in Cleveland. 
we're working to develop a plan to address those things, hoping that in the long run, and this is, this is life work, this is not something that we expect to change in the next two years, that ultimately we will begin to see improvements to the health of all Clevelanders. Wonderful. What types of programs are available to address infant mortality in Cleveland? Well, in addition to the centering program, there are a number of home visitation programs across the city. The Moms First program, which is run through the Cleveland Department of Public Health. There's the Moms and Baby First program, which is also a home visitation program that is run through one of our local uh, fairly qualified health centers, NEON. There's uh, midwifery programs happening at Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals. There's a program at Metro called the Nurse Family Practitioner Program, the NFP program. And then there's a doula program in our community called uh, Birthing Beautiful Communities, which um, all of these programs work with women throughout their pregnancies and almost, almost to and beyond the child's second birthday. And then there's another program called Pregnant with Possibilities, which is also a program that does outreach and education and nutrition with women who are pregnant. And so there are many, many resources out in the community. It's just being able to know where to look. So there's a lot of support in our community to help women through their pregnancies. Do, do patients have to access this through their providers or can they self-refer or call or sign up online on their own? And if so, how do they go about doing that? They can self-refer, they can, self can call. Uh, say for example, if an, a person was interested in participating in a home visitation program, all they would need to do is put in their search engine, you know, moms first, contact information would pop up. Uh, moms and Babies First, easily accessible, but also they could be referred by their primary care physician or their OBGYN. Okay. I have a question in the chat box. Oh, let me see. I said, um, don't forget Help Me Grow Home Visiting also has a program. Absolutely. Absolutely. I knew I wouldn't remember them all. <laughs> And what is the health department doing to help improve patient provider relations? Well, that's a great question. One of the things, a program in our community called First Year Cleveland, it is really a collaboration of all of the hospital systems, uh, home visitation programs, uh, working to ensure that first uh, physicians have healthier conversations with patients and patients have healthier conversations with uh, their providers in the form of first year Cleveland they have they're made up of action teams and they have collectively worked on ensuring that every hospital provides some level of anti-bias training to address um, issues that patients could have and so that process is well underway. There are safe sleep programs that all three hospitals are working collaboratively uh, to ensure that families have access to cribs, uh, baby boxes, all sorts of things. There's a significant amount of collaboration that's going on around helping women to quit smoking during pregnancy to improve those outcomes because we know that prematurity is by far the number one cause of infant mortality along with birth defects and sudden and unexplained uh, death while sleeping, so. Wonderful, thank you. I thank all of the speakers today for your time and I thank all of our participants who logged in. Thank you so much for sharing some of your evening with us. I hope you learned something. Um, if you have any further questions, you can always contact any of these providers. Um, we are all open to seeing new patients. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much.